Good evening. Good evening. Good to see you this evening. Uh, don't know if you remember me. I'm Pastor Bremer from Grace. I've actually uh, preached here a few times, but it's been a while. So it's good to be it's good to be back among you uh, once again. This is our, well, this is the last one you'll get a new pastor or a different pastor. Next week, uh, uh, you get a better pastor <laughs> back. So, uh, that's, that's for sure. So, we'll begin now with our opening hymn. <laughs> Remember your mercy. 
mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble and blameless right, and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies.
Excuse me. From John 13. Let's try that one. That didn't look right. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table close to Jesus. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give the morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What are you going to do? Do quickly. What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what you need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he immediately went out, and it was night. Thus the words of our, of our text. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Is there anything more biting in your life than a betrayal? I mean, let's face it. From our enemies, we expect evil things, and, and betrayal may be one of them, but we wouldn't even count it as betrayal because, look, well, they're our enemies. Yet we expect, though, from our friends that they be loyal, trustworthy, loving. Now, someone who we share our deepest thoughts, our inmost secrets, turns out to be someone who betrays us. Let's face it, it hurts. It hurts bad. Jesus obviously had someone close to him betray him. Everyone in this room knows who that was. But still, it hurt Jesus. You know the name Judas. In fact, uh, I dare say very few people would name their kids Judas. That one may be just as bad as naming your kid Adolf, which you don't see anymore either. Judas. He is forever known as the betrayer. Why would anyone know? Do something like that to Jesus. I mean, obviously, Jesus was good and holy. Jesus did great things. He would, he would go around and teach them the, the kindness of the kingdom of God and that it was there among them. He would heal the sick. He would give sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf. Great crowds would follow Jesus. Because of the things he did, his preaching, his love and kindness. Why would anyone betray that? I, well, I guess we could just put it in the classification regarding Judas that, that he was a sinner. He was a sinner just like Andrew and Peter were sinners, just like James and John were sinners, and the rest of the disciples, just like you and me. And just like those other sinners that were close to Jesus, Jesus called Judas to be among his inner circle. He went on missionary trips with Jesus. Jesus had just washed his feet preparing for the Last Supper, in fact, participated in the Passover with Jesus. The Bible, however, does make it very clear that Judas was very greedy. You remember when Mary anointed Jesus' feet with an expensive perfume? Judas thought, well, they could have sold
sold the perfume and given the money to the poor. But the Holy Spirit lets us in on a little secret with, with Judas. In John 12, he said, uh, John writes, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeping the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. So Judas loved money. So much so that he would, he would sell his Lord for 30 pieces of silver. That's what it would take. 30 pieces of silver and he would turn him over to the authorities. There. Done with Jesus. No betrayal hurts. It hurts because, because it, it's so personal. It's usually done by close friends. It also hurts because it's usually done in the secret, behind our backs, knowing very little. And that's obviously what was taking place on, on the night of our Lord's Passover meal. So much so it is our Lord himself has to point out that it's someone in the crowd, someone among his disciples, who is going to betray him. Someone. And the other disciples are going, is it me? Who is it? Peter even asked John, John, nudge him. Ask him. Who's he talking about? Is it one of us? Jesus says, no, it's the one I dipped this piece of bread in the water or in the wine with. And he does so, and the other disciples don't even see it. They figure, they figure that Judas is leaving because he has to pay for the room, pay for the food, give some money to the poor. Hmm, that wasn't the case. From the disciples' perspective, it obviously could have been any one of them, and that's in a, basically that's why they were somewhat defiant. Couldn't be me. Wasn't me. But I want you to I want you to ask yourself that. Could it be me? Could I betray Jesus? Am I the one that has stood in his way? Am I the one that's gotten in the way of his grace and his mercy and his love? Am I a betrayer of Jesus just like Judas? Hmm. Well, are you? I mean, what secret sins are you hiding? What are the sins that are you are committing or have committed that no one else knows about except Satan keeps throwing it in your face? Driving you to your knees. Ask yourself honestly. Because let's face it, this sermon does you no good if all you get out of it is that Judas was a terrible person. A really bad guy. I want you to ask yourself honestly. To look deep within at your life. I mean, let's face it, no one wakes up in the morning and says, you know, I think I'll fail God today. I think I'm going to do what's evil in his sight. No one wakes up with that. But the fact of the matter is, sinners sin. I've always said, pastors have the greatest job security if what they're called to do is preach to sinners. Because every time we meet on a Sunday morning, or in this case a Wednesday evening, we are preaching to sinners. And the scope of your sin, <clears throat> well, it can be off the charts. Sinners are going to sin, and they're going to sin in every way possible. That is for sure. 
So would you be there with the disciples and say, surely not I? We'll think again. We know what happens next, though. Judas receives that morsel, and Jesus says, go do what you got to do. And Judas leaves, and then the, the disciples and Jesus go into the garden, and there, and there, Judas tells the authorities, the one I kiss. Arrest him. Imagine that. It's a kiss that sends Jesus to the cross. But here on the cross, something takes place that kind of throws everything out of whack. I mean, we can understand and we can appreciate why God would punish sinners. We can appreciate why God saying, okay, you must be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. And then we admit, hopefully, honestly, that we are not holy. Now, the strange thing that happens, happens on the cross. Jesus takes our sin. Yeah. He took Judas' sin as well. Jesus became the greatest traitor. Jesus became the greatest idolater. Jesus became, well, name the commandment. Name your sin against it. And that's what Jesus became. So much so that the Father says to Jesus, I'm leaving you. I can't stand to be in your presence. That's what Jesus told us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know why God forsook Jesus. He bore the sin of the world. Your sin, my sin, Judas' sin, Peter's sin, Andrew's sin, everyone's sin. But not only bore it, but he suffered the very punishment of hell. Because what do you think you're going to punish without God? When God forsook his son, he would be punished with hell itself. Your hell. Your punishment. And he would do so for us. So that you wouldn't have to suffer the punishment that you deserve. Jesus would take it on himself. And that punishment would be in full. Nothing left. No sin unpaid for. Isaiah said it best, by his wounds we are healed. How could Jesus love and forgive traitors like Judas, like Peter, like you and me? The amazing part of the story is that he does forgive them in the most amazing way. Unfortunately for Judas, though, his unbelieving heart led him to go and take his own life, not placing his trust, not believing that God in Christ would forgive him all his sin. But God or Jesus made peace with the Father on our behalf. Not just the end of hostility. No, we would be one with God. We would be with God. We have a place in heaven prepared for us. So, ask not then how God could love and forgive a traitor like Judas, which he did. But sadly, Judas turned his back on that forgiveness. Ask instead, how could God love and forgive a traitor, a sinner like you and me? How? In Jesus. In Jesus, who carried that sin to the cross, who suffered and died and 
peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please stand.
Could you either way? I can't reach if I'm up here. <laughs>